Hello everyone, my name is Robert Allen, your MTSA Mooting Officer. In this episode of Addressing the Advocate, I thought it'd be interesting for us to apply a bit more of a focused lens on criminal practice. And to help me do that, I'm very privileged to be joined today by criminal practitioner at Stuart Dingle of 15 Newbridge Street Chambers. Stuart is now entering his 10th year of practice at the bar, and he has experience in a very wide range of criminal cases, although I have found it particularly interesting looking at his CV, at his emphasis on football work, so I'm sure we'll have time to ask him about that. Stuart, thank you very much for joining me and welcome to Addressing the Advocate. Thank you very much, Robert. First of all, just a general question. Uh, what attracted you first to the criminal bar? I think it was it, the starting point is it was always the area of law that I was intellectually interested in at a very kind of highfalutin level, the interaction with the state and the person and all the kind of thing we tell you not to go on about too much in your, um, your advocacy uh, pupillage applications. But it was always what interested me. Um, that's what made me look at it. And then what made me choose it was the, the emphasis on spoken advocacy. And the real emphasis that every day you'll be in court, even I think looking back over my years of practice and my years of uh, 15 New Bridge Street, there is only a handful of days when I've not been in court. Yes. Um, it's probably in double digits now, but not by much, you know, even during the pandemic, even during lockdown, we're still in court almost every day. And that is really what appealed to me. It was that lifestyle, the, the juries and the, the, the judges and the arguing. And being able to do that every day reliably be on your feet that, that's why i think drew me to it and has it lived up to those expectations obviously with covid it's been a difficult time but it has you know it absolutely has and um everything everyone says about the criminal bar being a dreadful place to work and the standard of living is awful and the money is terrible it, it, it's all true but it's all worth it to me and it's been exactly what i hoped it would be and it is in its own way, very enjoyable and rewarding, yes. either because the, the cases and the advocacy itself can be enjoyable or because you do often, or at least sometimes, walk away with a real solid feeling of having done a real service for someone, either for society or for a, a victim, a witness, a complainant or a defendant. Yes. Um, yes. But yeah, it's absolutely held up that we're still in court every day. I actually appeared in court this morning. Um, I got phoned at 11.10 saying there's an emergency hearing, we need you by 11.30, dial into court. So I did. <laughs> that, that was my morning. The last minute nature of the criminal bar really being demonstrated there even today. Yeah, it's, it, it, to start with, it's something that mostly happens to pupils and very junior practitioners. Mm. And then as you get more experience, your diary becomes more settled. It stops being a, what am I doing tomorrow and starts being, OK, well, this case of mine is in tomorrow and that case of mine is in for next week. But I think the pandemic has thrown all that into disarray. Yes. We've all had hearings cancelled. We've all had things moved at short notice, no notice. Sometimes you'll be told by a judge in a hearing at 12 o'clock on Friday that your trial is definitely coming in on Monday, having not heard that before. And then it comes to the list coming out at 4.30 and your trial's not there. And no one's yeah, given you yeah. any explanation as to why. And the, the chaos seems to now be hitting people at all levels of the profession, all levels of seniority. Just focusing in on advocacy, because obviously that's something which really brought you to the criminal bar. Is it something that you've always had a flair for, would you say, growing up? Is it something that you enjoyed doing in different ways? Or is it a practice that you've had to learn uh, over your years? I've always enjoyed performance and public speaking. Um, I've done amateur dramatics. I was, things you won't find from my chamber's profile, I was a competition ballroom dancer. Wow. Um, um, I've done a lot of that sort of thing, debates, mooting. I've always been enjoy, I've enjoyed that. Advocacy itself is a very specific skill, I think. Mm. And it is a skill. It is something you have to learn. I flatter myself it's something I have some base ability in. I don't know whether everyone who's opposed me would agree with that or not. <laughs> but it is definitely a skill. It's something that you, you, you learn, you have to learn, um, you have to keep learning mm. both how to do it and to really appreciate it. I think there is always something to be enjoyed from advocacy. But um, so no, it's a sort of both. I, I had a flair for that field, if you like, for the dramatic. 
Yes. But yes. the advocacy itself is a very precise, refined skill that we all have to study. And you say you're, you're still learning and learning on the job. What is it right now that still makes you feel you're learning advocacy? Is it your own experience seeing others in court or a mixture of all of that together? Both, I think. Um, we're all, of course, learning a new way to do advocacy now, which is remotely. I'm trying to persuade usually a judge to accept your submission or your mitigation when everything's just done and you're just a voice on the screen or face on the screen. But I don't think you ever stop learning. You know, you always watch other advocates either in your trials or who are opposing you or co-defending with you and go, well, that's a good, that's a good way of doing yeah. that. I'll make a note of that. I'll make a note of your point to counter it later and I'll make a point of how you made your point so I can copy it later. Yes. Yeah. I think, you know, if you're fortunate enough to have a junior brief, something like that, both your leaders and other leaders can be great to learn from. Um, and sometimes, though I hate to say it, you can hear someone do something and go, oh, that didn't land. Mm. Must, must make a note never to say that or <laughs> something like that. Learning how not to do it at times. Yeah. Well, we all learn by example. Um, I think someone once said to me that the, the thing to really appreciate about your bar course and your pupillage when you get it is that it's the last time anyone really gives you feedback. Mm. It's the last time someone goes, hey, you're doing a great job at this. Well, that, that was good, but maybe don't phrase it quite that way. Think about incorporating this in the way you phrase it. Because yes. we never as professionals sort of offer feedback to each other on their advocacy. You'll yes. occasionally get, oh, that was a good speech. Or, you know, you did that well. Or, you know, go easy on me. You crucified my client there. Or you get that kind of comment. But that training you're going through at the moment and the, the things you do through your in and the new practitioners programs and all that kind of thing, they're the last, the last chance you have to really have people dissect your advocacy and give you really detailed feedback on how it sounds. Mm. So treasure it, use it, um, especially the ones organised by Middle Temple and the other inns. It's interesting to hear you say that, uh, Stuart, because the last episode we did was with uh, Master Dominic Grieve, and he was talking about his experience <clears throat> doing uh, criminal advocacy uh, and various cases in the 1980s. He was called to the bar in 1980 and said that at that time it was very common for there to be a lot of feedback given over, you know, you'd, you'd be in the, in, the, in the mess after you'd finished your case or before your case and you would hear <clears throat> these comments being made to you in a nice way but saying, well, I wouldn't have done <clears throat> that or I really like the way you did this. And so there was quite a lot more feedback at that time. And he was saying that that's something that he's found change at the bar. Uh, and you're saying the same, that you're less likely now, perhaps, to get that feedback from your colleagues. Uh, why do you think that is? is? Is it just the nature of practice has become more formalised? It's there's less. I don't know, is then. the short answer. Um, yeah. I don't know. I think the profession is becoming a little much more formalised is the way I'd put it. We're becoming more professionalized in almost a business sense a bit more business-like yeah. i think yeah. um we still have that collegiate at collegiate atmosphere uh, i hope we'll never lose it i think it's what sets us apart as a profession we are still a vocation not just a job yes and you do still get elements of that feedback i can't comment on what it was like <laughs> in the 1980s um i wasn't born but um <laughs> yeah it is it is something which i think is is rare these days it's quite common to be polite to each other to be courteous to go oh, i liked your speech but it's rare you get a oh that was a very clever way of making that point i really like the way you did that or, oh i wouldn't put that yeah yeah maybe um, there's just nothing nice to compliment me about i don't know but, um. <laughs> i'm sure that's not the case um and you said seeing seeing advocates on the job is there anything particularly that stands out to you as being a really interesting way of uh, performing advocacy that you've then taken into your own uh, skill set <laughs> try to develop and use as your own? Um, I think the biggest trick I picked up wasn't actually from an advocate I saw, it was from Lord Judge, right. who was a uh, master treasurer of the inn the year I got my pupillage, which dates me, I think. But he, he said to me, never be afraid of silence. Yes. Whether, yes. whether you're giving a speech, whether you're um, examining a witness, whatever you're doing, never be afraid of silence. Um, it will make your jury pay attention. It will terrify your witnesses, um, often into speaking when maybe they shouldn't be speaking. Mm. And I think that was very solid advice. 
that was very solid advice that I've kept with me. In terms of something I've observed, um, it's, it's very much that you really need to pay attention to your tribunal and reading the room effectively. I've seen an awful lot of advocates who clearly have their script, which they've prepared meticulously and speak very fluently, but they've lost the judge somewhere. Yeah. And the judge has asked a question which makes it seem to me that they're on different tracks. Yes. And rather than reaching back and bringing the judge to where they are, or rather than seeing that three of the jury have got their eyes closed and are really le and are leaning back or what have you, they plough on through. Yeah. They're a bit too focused on their, their script. And I'm guilty of this as well. So you really need to make sure you're bringing your tribunal with you um, and that you keep an eye on who you're talking to, be it your judge or your witness. And it's not so much a technique, I suppose, as a priority. Let's try, and, and this is going to be a bit of a, a convoluted way of doing it because obviously we don't have a particular example case in front of us, but if I could take you for, for a moment or two into imagining we're, we're preparing for a jury trial, a generic jury trial, obviously it's so different depending on the case, but what are your specific thoughts with respect to each <clears throat> a separate element of that trial? If we could start by imagining you're opening a case, hmm. what is your general emphasis when you're when you're thinking about how you're going to open a case when thinking about how you open it you need to have the entire narrative of the case locked solid in your head because you need to you need to take your jury with you through that and i think sometimes people forget that the jury know absolutely nothing about what's going on um, there's lots of different ways of of starting a closing speech of doing a, sorry starting an opening speech doing an opening speech for me it's about engagement first you engage the jury you explain why why you're there you set the scene and then you can do the my name's Stuart I appear for the prosecution please turn to page three of your binder you'll find an indictment this is what an indictment is I always like to start with a this case is a burglary or a this defendant is accused of hitting someone in the street. Just yeah. grab them and bring them in. Because if you start with, hello, ladies and gentlemen, please turn to page four of your binder. My name is Mr. Dingle. I will be your stereotypical lawyer speaking for seven hours this morning. Um, nothing wrong with that style. I'm sure people do it much better than I could and therefore aren't able to gain the jury's attention. But for me, have the story in your head give the jury uh, an opening pitch very briefly so they know what you're talking about, then go to the indictment, then explain, then explain your role, then start talking burden and standard of proof, and then go into the detail. Yes. You've got to have that engagement. You've got to have that headline, that attention-grabbing show starter. And eye contact with the jury at that moment when you're paying Always. the picture? Yeah. Whenever you're speaking to the jury, eye contact. Um, yeah. Even when you're speaking to the witness sometimes, um, Definitely make eye contact with members of the jury. Engage them individually. Don't stay too long staring at any one person because that's how you freak people out. But <laughs> engage with the group, pan your eyes, you know, w w depending on what you're talking about. If it's, if it's very serious, don't crack jokes, you know. Yes. yes. Um, that's the, you know, it, it can be right to use levity in speeches. Some cases are so innately ridiculous that you might find the jury laughing anyway. If you've got CCTV of somebody who's stark naked apart from a pair of socks running down the street, you're going to get a set of giggles from the jury almost inevitably, depending yes. on the context. So don't yeah. be afraid of laughter, but don't chase it. Definitely yeah. engage with the jury, look them in the eye, pan around, don't linger too long on any one person. You know, standard kind of public speaking stuff, really. All that stuff applies. And again, use silence to draw them in. And in advance of that, are you... Are you writing a script? How does your how does your mind operate? Are you doing that? <clears> are <throat> you actually typing that out or, or handwriting that and then bringing it in? I think this is intensely personal to each advocate. Yeah, yeah. For me, I don't write a script. I write a selection of sort of bullet points, things I want to hit, things I want to make sure I say. I tend to write my structure rather than my phrasing unless there's a particular phrase I want to use or a particular thing I want to say to make sure it lands in a very particular way. 
and I've chosen very specific words to give that effect. That I'll yeah. write. But I certainly don't have a, a long speech of text with all the connectives in. It's all bullet points. It's all headlines and what I want to say and where I'm going next. Yes, yes. Interesting. And let's go springing in, in, this, in this wonderful fake trial with, with no real case um, <laughs> over to uh, examination in chief. What is your principal focus and the objectives that you're trying to achieve through your advocacy in exam in chief? So there's a, there's a fundamental difference with examination chief as to whether you're getting a, a full account out of someone, someone like a complainant or a defendant who has to give the entire story and has to effectively say the entirety of your case for you yeah. and a witness who just saw a specific thing. When you're doing a... When you're doing that full account, the most important thing is that you need to have a really clear idea in what direction you want to lead them. It sounds obvious, but I've seen it's so easy to go, and oh, now we focused on this topic. Just to hop back to that thing we were speaking about 25 minutes ago when you said the person was wearing a red jumper, was that, a, was that an Arsenal jumper? You know, you, you need to make sure that your, your structure is fluid. Sometimes that's uh, chronological narrative. Sometimes that's topic based. But you need to make sure that you have that really clear narrative so it can come out in a really clear way. Because the clearer it is and the more straightforward it seems, the more believable it is. The more believable it is. And sometimes witnesses need help with that, not because they're not necessarily being truthful, but because it's very easy to suddenly be under a huge amount of pressure and to forget a detail. Yes. You need to make sure you know what you need them to hit and the order you want them to hit it in. After that, the important thing, which I think we all find difficult sometimes, is to make sure it's the witness speaking, not you. Yeah. It's not about you, it's about them. Um, so you need to make sure that they have time to speak and be fluent, because it's them who's being assessed. Obviously, in, in muting, it's not. In, in um, the bar court, it isn't. It's you who's being assessed, which is perhaps the most artificial thing about it. But you need to give them time. So it's that combination of effectively being able to herd them in the right direction, let them speak until they hit your next checkpoint, and then sort of collect them, redirect them, and send them on to the next one. So that what comes out is their story, but it's their story structured in such a way as it can be absorbed easily. Yes. And what kind of person do you find most difficult in that situation? Is it the person who is a very, very difficult person to actually get to speak, try, like trying to get blood out of a stone and they just, you know, they're not engaging? Or is it that person who will talk on and on and on for a long time <coughs> and is perhaps distracting from the actual clarity of the evidence that you're trying to to focus on i find it much easier to deal with an overly talkative witness that has a, an axe to grind than a um than a taciturn one or one who's reluctant to give their account because it's much easier as an advocate to stop a witness yes. than it is to yes. give them more detail yes it isn't leading to go just pause you there and take a note now, very important but i just need to make a note of that which brings them up short than it is to go that's lovely, but who was it who hit you? Um, it's much harder to get those other bits of detail out of them without leading, I find anyway. Yeah. Um, so I'd always much rather have a talkative witness and I can rein in than a silent one I have to poke. And how do you find they generally are? It's a complete mix. Um, there's so many things that go into why a witness might be one way or another. It's why it's so important to have, when it's your client, a chance to speak to them at length beforehand yeah so you have an idea of how your account's going to go out it I, I couldn't draw you any kind of percentages as to what people are like you never really know what a witness is going to be like i've seen people who their witness statement is written in a particular way and it sounds like they've got an axe to grind or it sounds like they are very very quiet and they get in the witness box and they're completely different yeah. People forget, I think, sometimes that the witness statement is not written by the witnesses, it's written by the police officers. Yes, yes. Um, or, I suppose, in um, civil cases by the, the solicitors. <clears throat> you might have a perception of how they're going to be, but you've got to be very ready to change your, 
your your approach if you're if you're surprised at that moment. I think that we'll we'll touch on this more when we talk about cross examination. But I think that flexibility is perhaps the most important trait an advocate can possess. That ability to respond to what's going on. It's much yes. much easier to write a persuading sounding series of questions examination chief or questions of examination. It's much harder to hear a thing and suddenly have to spin off to a different track. Let's go there then, let's go to cross-examination and your, your general overview thoughts on that first. Overview thoughts, um, be really clear on what you need to do with this witness. It's not always to attack them. It's not always to undermine them or their credibility. Challenge what needs to be challenged and challenge it hard where you have evidence or something to undermine the witness or prove that they're lying or incorrect in some way, feel free to set the appropriate evidential trap, though it's not sort of de rigueur to refer to it that way. Yeah. Um, but also agree where you need to agree. And sometimes a witness can be got on board and there's an advantage to not going too aggressive too quickly or even not going aggressive at all. Even a complainant in a crime can sometimes find themselves agreeing with 90% plus of the defense's case and if you can get that that's a dream because it's always more persuasive if it comes out of the other side's witnesses yes I think so yes. that's the, that that's the overview that's the first thing you do with your witness be really clear in your mind and have a, a written list of what you need um, what you need out of them, what you need to hit, what you need to ask them, what you need to at least try and get agreement on and what you think you can get agreement on. But then the detail of that, as I said earlier, is to be so prepared to be flexible, it's almost hard to express. You never know what a witness is going to say. You're told yeah. at Bar Course, and it's quite true, don't expect to get the dream answer. Don't expect yeah. to get a witness yeah. suddenly break down and go, you're right, you're right, I'm sorry, or whatever it is. <laughs> But also it does sometimes happen. One in a hundred, one in a thousand cases, you will have a witness who suddenly goes, actually, I think you're right. Yeah. And if that stalls you, if that, if that completely destroys you, or worse, if you carry on asking questions as though they hadn't said it, yeah, yeah, the jury's yeah. going to look at you like you're a complete moron. Yeah. And it's very easy to do. I, I say this, it sounds like such an obvious point, but it's so easy to do that you get so locked into your impression of what the witness is going to be like, so locked into how you want to ask your questions, that you almost don't hear them go, well, maybe it was three o'clock. Mm. You're not listening. Or actually, actually, I mean, maybe they didn't actually punch me. Maybe they did just walk towards me. Because a maybe is not a no and it's so easy to miss those linguistic differences if you're plowing on through with your questioning yes yes and it's listening for inconsistencies through the course of that mm. cross-examination as well because it's easy when I mean, we get taught on the bar course you're looking for inconsistencies with with the witness statement and you can make a big thing of those from you know it's easy when you <coughs> examination in chief the night before rather than in the in the process of the court and you can you can pick out those inconsistencies but they may well say something through the course of that cross-examination to you that you've then got to pick on and respond to which is completely unexpected and unforeseen for you it's particularly important i think i mean it's important for everyone as you say it's particularly important for a prosecutor because when you're cross-examining the defendant if they give evidence that's often the your biggest opportunity to make ground in many ways yes to actually challenge the defendant and you often have you sometimes have almost no idea excuse me at all about what they're going to be saying you'll have a defense statement usually not always but if they've given a no in if they've given a no a no account interview they've gone no comment and then they've given a defense statement which basically just says i admit presence but i deny taking part in the offense mm. you have almost nothing to go on so your preparation has to be what is my case? What do I know? What evidence do I have? What directions do I want to take them in? And then almost everything else you have is going to be inconsistencies, undermining them, um, seeing if they, if you go through the bit of evidence, the bit of account that you think is fabricated again, do they say something slightly different? If so, pick them up on it. All these little um, sort of techniques that you learn, that's perhaps where they're most appropriate is when you're doing that cross-examination where you're looking at 
their account for almost for the first time. And through the course of a cross-examination, or indeed an, an examination in chief, you're having to pay great attention to your witness. But is part of your focus still on the jury? And how are you, where is the jury in your mind at that point? That's a very good question. Um, I'm going to try and resist the lawyer's answer of it depends. You need to have an eye on them. You need to see how something's landing. I think we've all done or been in a case where a question's come out the wrong way from our opponent and we're looking at the jury and we see three or four of the jury members wince or shake their heads or something similar and the other advocate hasn't noticed it yeah. because they were looking at their witness quite properly. They're asking the witness questions and so they're looking at their witness but you've got to keep part of your awareness on your jury it's a difficult balance to strike, I think. I'd say no less than 10% of your awareness if you want to be a, <laughs> uh, if you want to be a commercial lawyer and put a number on these things. No less than 10% of your awareness. You could have but, that, um, much, if that much consciousness into the, the portions of your mind that you're focusing on. <laughs> I truly don't. I truly don't. <laughs> and I'm sure I, like almost everyone else, when we feel, when we feel that the, we, we've got a witness on the run, as it were, that they are admitting something they shouldn't be admitting, we drive it home. And we become laser focused on the answers and the questions we're asking. Mm. But if your jury hate you for asking it, it doesn't get you anywhere. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm sure we don't want to go into war stories too much, but I had a duress case where somebody was um, basically alleging that they were being assaulted by their partner and that's why they committed a series of offences. And perfectly right and proper set of questioning from the other advocate, which was effectively, if you say this person was being so violent to you, why didn't you make any attempts to escape them? Yes. But they were phrased yes. in such a way as it was very much a, well, why didn't you leave your abuser? Yeah. Which yeah. is a very easy mistake to make in phrasing, but of course is not the thing you ask of a vulnerable person. Why didn't you leave yeah. your abuser? Because I was being abused by them. And even though the witness was faltering, the jury were picking up on that wavelength. And you could see that the jury just didn't like that line of questioning at all. It's very easy to do that kind of thing. So you do definitely need to keep some awareness of them at all and be prepared to throw out. I mean, don't panic. You can never predict exactly what a jury is saying. But you learn, I think, to read a room, even if you can't read an individual juror. And would you say when you, on the, I'm sure for yourself, on the very, very rare, if not never occasion, that you, you lose a jury uh, in the course of how you are trying to approach uh, the particular cross-examination, how do you bring them back on board? Is that impossible? Or are there techniques that you can use? If, if you know you've put your foot in it with a jury, can you then try and regain their trust? It's difficult to do. I think it can be possible. It usually involves some element of a facing. Um, if it's a question you asked that went beyond the pale, um, you can apologize to the judge and sort of you wouldn't apologize to the jury but by yeah. apologizing to the judge for a question or by even apologizing to a witness if it was a, a really bad question i hope no one gets to that stage but i'm sure some people do but by apologizing to the judge i'm sorry you that was poorly phrased i'll rephrase that yes that kind of thing can do a lot to repair the jury if you just find yourself saying something stupid which we all do or at least i yeah. do yeah um acknowledge it to the jury particularly if it's, if, it's, um, if it's in a closing speech or something like that. Just something, you know, whatever the turn of phrase is, sorry, members of the jury, I'll put my teeth back in. You know, whatever it is, whatever small phrase there is you need to do, be a little bit self-effacing. Don't be afraid to be humble. Um, yes. It's sort of an extension to the principle, I'm sure you're all still told, but if you don't know some, something, admit you don't know something. Yeah, yeah. Um, it's sort of an extension of that. But we, yeah, appearing to be authentic is probably the way to get back to the jury. Yes. I'd say. And don't yeah. be afraid to be humble. So you alluded to, to closing speeches there. Um, again, so dependent on how this imaginary trial that we've just run through very quickly has gone. But uh, I suppose let's take two examples. Let's say, first of all, a trial that you feel has gone pretty well. How are you approaching that sort of a closing speech and what sort of factors are you really trying to emphasize in the good evidence that you've been able to elicit? 
if you think the entire trial has gone well and you've got really strong resounding points, you're going to hang your speech on those. You're going to hang your speech on, this is so simple, members of the jury, I don't need to speak to you for very long. Yeah. He said he did it. He was standing over the body with a knife, cackling and saying, I do it, I did it again. I did it and I do it again. Why are we here? What more do we need to say? You know what your decision must be. And you do a short speech. Um, if you've got a more problematic case, either because it's tricky or because a piece of evidence has come out in a horrible way or because your client has, has put their foot in it or the other side haven't put their foot in it when you really hope they would, you need to deal with the bad points. That's when you do a more detailed speech, a more finessed speech, I think, and you have to actually deconstruct arguments. But the tip I'd give for everyone on a closing speech is leave space in your speech to deal with the prosecution's closing speech. It is when you're defending, I should say. Yeah. And when you're prosecuting, try not to overreach because it's so easy to overreach as a prosecutor in closing, to get wrapped up in the rhetoric and go just a little bit further than the evidence really allows you to go. And as a defense advocate, and I, I mostly defend, I do prosecute, but I mostly defend. That's a gift. Yes. However good your point is, if you can start or at least start the main body of your speech by pointing something, that, pointing out something the prosecution has said that is wrong or an exaggeration, mm -hmm. it really helps everything that you, your chap says to seem reasonable in comparison. So leave space for that and keep an ear out for it. There are almost no prosecution speeches, including mine, which don't give you some ammunition to fire back. Yeah. So again, you, it, it may be more of a speech, but you've got to be responsive in that moment and you've got to be absolutely piggybacking on what's been said. Mm. And well, whenever you write your closing speech, don't make it during your prosecution closing speech because you need to be paying attention yeah. and taking notes. Yeah. <laughs> And, you're on the train uh, to court, do it in a lunch break, whatever it is. <laughs> Sometimes you don't get time to prep it. Sometimes yes. you fully expect a two-day trial and then a witness vanishes and all of a sudden the judge goes, can you close now, Mr Dingle? And in that moment of uh, various phrases or, or, or crutches that you can, can grab onto if, if you're feeling immediately that you, you're, you're struggling with where you're going to go next, are there, are there things that you will direct yourself to? I think everyone develops their own. We all develop a few little set phrases um, as to how we explain, particularly things like burden of proof, which we yes, need to yes. you, you need to rattle on about in every trial. Um, we all have a way or a couple of ways of phrasing those that we quite like or we think has got us quite far. And there are a few points which are common to every trial. Things like in all or most trials, in almost every trial, you have some kind of adverse inference from interview, for example, in criminal trials. It's relatively rare that somebody says everything during their interview that they later rely on in their defence. Yeah. If you've got something missing that you, as a prosecutor, that's a, that can be a, a safe point of harbour to navigate to if you find yourself suddenly having to do a closing speech when you weren't expecting to. Yeah. I mean, having said that, particularly in the Crown Court, don't be afraid to go, actually, Your Honour, I need half an hour to prep this. I'm not ready to close, I need to speak to I need to speak to my officer in the case or whatever it is. Very few judges won't give you that time. It right. tends to be thinking back to my magistrate court days, that, that was that's when you suddenly get the well, there's the evidence, we've heard it. No, you can't get a lunch break. I know it's 120, but close now, please. Yeah. And you can say, I want a lunch break first, I need to prep it. They say you're an experienced advocate, carry on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's there's not really much you can do in that situation. Um, you can't say, well, I'm not, no, no I'm not experienced. <laughs> <laughs> no, not really. Um, it's, you can get a lot further than most advocates think when it comes to time managing your tribunal and asking for breaks and asking for time and that sort of thing. But sometimes you'll find a tribunal who'll just, you'll just, it's like running into a brick wall and you just have to make do with whatever you've got in front of you. And in those instances, navigate your safe harbours. Get the things you need to get down, down. It may not be the most flowery or the most technical speech you've ever done, but make sure you have your key fundamental things down and yes. navigate yes. to and from them. Yeah. You can't unsay something you've said. Yes. Yeah. 
And I imagine that moment is, is one which causes particular anxiety at that, at that particular time. Uh, are there moments, and this is almost a silly question, because for everybody, I'm, I'm sure there, there really are, but <laughs> particular moments when you feel nervous in the course of a trial. And if so, what do you do about those nerves? Are there particular things that you can go to or rely on to, to try and combat the nerves? I mean, I get nervous every trial. Mm -hmm. Every trial, um, there's still a little flutter. I don't think that's ever going to go away. It reminds yeah. me very much of being on stage, although we try and shy away from those comparisons for good and obvious reasons. Um, there is an element of performance to what we do, um, particularly, particularly with the jury, where you spend an entire day in front of them and you have to be in character to an extent, you need your being observed for the entire time you're in that room. And that can be quite nerve wracking. Mm. So the two points I always get nervous is right before the trial starts and right before my client, if I'm defending, goes into the box to give evidence. The only real armor against nerves is preparation. Yes. I'm sure every student is sick to death of advocacy teachers telling them that. And it is true as well that particularly in crime, sometimes the reason why you're nervous is that you haven't had time to prepare because your trial starts at 10 and you were handed your papers at 9.45. And when you pointed out to the judge that you had two witnesses that hadn't been proof, they said, very well, you can have 20 minutes. Yes. yes. You do get days like that. That was, in fact, my first magistrate's trial many years ago was precisely that situation. And you will be terrified and then you won't have time to be terrified. Yeah, yeah. In terms of what you can do to reduce those nerves when they're hitting you, there's plenty of sort of actors type techniques, controlled breathing, all that kind of thing. Um, try not to fidget with your pen. Mm. Try not to look too nervous because mm. juries pick up on it, I think, if you look nervous. But there's no real magic, magic bullet for it. Preparation can get you a lot of the way. It can stop you seeming like an idiot when, of course, you aren't an idiot, but you're nervous or you make a mistake or you say the wrong thing. Yeah. And you will say the wrong thing. Yeah. You absolutely will. Everyone will. <laughs> Even the most experienced QCs, or maybe not some of them, but the rest of us mere mortals, we will certainly <laughs> say the wrong thing. Don't be shocked when you do. Prepare thoroughly. Be prepared to take a moment and we come back to that silence again. Yes. If you're flustered, if you're not sure where to go next, just pause. It will not seem as long to the jury as it does to you. Yeah. Yeah. Or the judge. And it comes across as quite profound. You're about to make an important point. So you're... you're Absolutely. Yeah. It's Absolutely. Profound. And as soon as I work out what my profound important point is, I'll share it with the jury. <laughs> exactly. Um, just on, on a slight tangent, I, I must ask a little bit more about some of these football cases, because I see... <laughs> coming through what what particular advocacy <laughs> challenges do they pose they are very interesting cases actually both legally and evidentially because they are almost always at some level a police complaint mm. almost all of them involve some form of self-defense either against rival groups of fans or against police and police practices there is an awful lot of is the amount of force used in these circumstances excessive? Is this a proper arrest? Is the arrest appropriate? So you take, you get these cases which are on the face of it, very, very straightforward. You've got groups of people having a fight and then you drill down into them for even a few minutes and all of a sudden they become hugely technical and yes. they involve lots of quasi bad character because police officers, um, police departments will have long lists of times when your client has sat on top of a police car to take a photograph in disobedience of police orders. And they want to put that in as an example of your um, chap being anti-authority or anti-police anti or, you know, raucous or rowdy or being disordered. But they're almost always of good character apart from that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. So it becomes a very fine balance of effectively criticizing professionals who are held in high regard by the public. So you need to be strong and you need to point out what may well be wrongdoing, 
yeah. without yeah. losing a jury whose start point is almost always not going to have sympathy for you or your client. Yes, yes. Which presents its own challenge. But they're quite often legal, those challenges. Yes. Anyone who tells you crime doesn't have much law in it um, needs, needs to do some, some technical cases, I think, with laws of evidence. That's exactly what they have. That's exactly where they are, is you tend to have a day of legal argument for every two days in court in those cases. Mm. Uh, Something I fell into. I'm not, a, I'm not a, a football player myself. I've never been a football passionate supporter. Um, but it was an area of law I found interesting and worked in and found some solicitors who found interesting and worked in and we've sort of continued to work together ever since. Okay, it's interesting. So you, so you sort of, again, sort of found an area of practice or an area of practice really found you rather than the, the other yeah. way. It was much more that way around. I never went looking for it. Yeah. Um, there were a couple of semi high profile cases, not in the sense of being celebrities, but in the sense of being large incidents that I was fortunate enough to be involved in and made a couple of, I flatter myself, halfway intelligent arguments that, that had some success. Um, and that got me enough to the attention of some people who work in that field and are, ve are very, very good solicitors, I have to say. Very, very good. Um, yes. And we've been working together ever since. If you, just to, to summarize, if you had to make three points and I, this is generally the, the common, the common love for, for all advocates is to make three, three arguments. If you had to make three arguments um, as to what makes for good advocacy from what you've seen with a particular focus for crime, what would those be? Firstly, it has to be concise. If it isn't worth saying, if it doesn't further your point, don't say it. Skeleton arguments rarely need to be longer than two pages. Keep it succinct and focused as well. That's point one, concise. Point two, it needs to be tailored. Speak differently to a judge, to what you would to a witness, to what you would to a jury. It's got to be very different, very tailored. You've got to be very aware of who your tribunal is. And once you have been in practice a while, you'll start to know your judges. The question that scared me the most when I joined the bar was, oh, who, who's your judge tomorrow? Who are you in front of? Because I almost always answered I had no idea. Or I had the name, but I had nothing else to them apart from their name. Um, you very quickly learn who they are by being in practice. Um, it doesn't come from, or at least doesn't come for me, from any prior knowledge or nepotism or no one in my family is anywhere near this career. Um, it just comes from being in front of them and having a good or bad experience that remembers, that means you remember them. So once you know your judge, you can also tailor your arguments to them. Some like detail, some like law, some like incredibly succinct, even beyond the realm of what a normal judge wants. And I think every judge wants their submissions to be concise. So tailor it. And the third one, I think, is what we talked about already, which is to be receptive and be fluid, be flexible. Um, whether that's to a judge's question, whether that's to a witness's answer, whether that's to whatever the argument that was made two minutes before your argument started is, you need to be receptive to what's on around you and to your audience. So it needs to be concise, needs to be tailored to your audience, you need to be receptive to the room. Well, Stuart, thank you so much for all of your time and that very, um, very good and robust advice. I think uh, every, everybody would be very sensible to take it. Uh, it's been fascinating to hear in detail about the criminal trial uh, and just thank you so much for sitting down with me and having this this conversation it's been great. my pleasure it's an honor to be spoken to thank you very much <laughs> well, i don't pretend to be a uh, i don't pretend to be an expert on advocacy but if uh, if something i've said is helpful to someone then i'm very glad absolutely i think it uh, it definitely will be thanks Stuart. my pleasure thank you very much robert